Welcome to the Prep Pigskin Report Podcast, hosted by Papa Pig himself, Paul Rudy. Everybody, welcome to episode number eight of the PPR Podcast. In the center of the sandwich between Bert and myself is none other than Larry McCarron, a 12-year NFL veteran, a member of the Packer Hall of Fame, a member of the Wisconsin Broadcast Hall of Fame, and a four-year survivor of working with me at WFRV in Green Bay, <laughs> Wisconsin. Mr. McCarron, thank you so much for making time for us. And those times in Northeast Wisconsin, Paul, they were they were the best of times and the worst of times. <laughs> yes, yes, they were, but we won't have to really uh, go over that. I, I imagine you experienced the best of times flying back from the Bay Area. Can we talk a little Packers football off the top? Uh, are those road trips a little more bearable when you uh, come home with a victory? Actually, to be perfectly candid, Paul, those Sunday night games on the coast regardless of result are like are like miserable i mean you get in at 5 a.m and uh, you know the whirling swirling world of showbiz just grinds on and so a couple hours later you're back getting the next show ready and it's it's tough but it was a it was one great great victory for the green bay packers uh tough opponent short week on the road and they played really really well Hey, Packers off to an interesting start. What's, what's the, the feel around with the Aaron Rodgers thing? I mean, is everybody, you know, let bygones be guy, bygones after that after that whole thing went down and after that one really bad performance, now he's back on it? Or are people still a little bit jumpy with him? Well, I, I think they've kind of gotten back to Aaron Rodgers is absolutely positively great uh -huh. after the last couple of games. I mean, <laughs> like, like it, it's hard to be too upset when the guy is playing, uh, let's face it, MVP, Hall of Fame caliber football the last couple of games. So I, I don't think uh, people at least outwardly are complaining too much. But uh, I, I think there was some uh, angst among Packer fans, among the Packer faithful uh, when that thing was going on during the uh, off season and even during the preseason when he wasn't playing and they weren't watching him at practice uh, be Aaron Rodgers because he was. Uh, you've played for the team for a long time. You've now broadcast for the team for a long time. You've covered the team uh, as a news, uh, as a sports director for a long time. Uh, as you look at the uh, evolution of the sport of football, what, what are the biggest changes that jump out at you? Well, I, I don't think... Uh, the old days, the good old days, where uh, we were rough and tough and hard to bluff, and when we spit on the sidewalk, it cracked. I mean, it's a different kind of game now. Uh, much more concerned about player safety. Uh, I think the game has gotten bigger and faster and stronger. I think as far as the technical part of it, as far as techniques and execution, I don't think they are what they once were because uh, people, quite frankly, don't practice as hard. But uh, the game has gotten, because of very creative coaching, a lot more complex. I mean, there is so much eye candy going on, like, hey, look here, and we're going to hit you over there. And there's so much of that going on, and we saw a bunch of it Sunday night when the Packers are playing the San Francisco 49ers. Kyle Shanahan may be the master of it. And uh, I'll tell you what, Matt LaFleur worked with him uh, in a number of stops, and uh, he's he's right there as well. And you see all that stuff going on where you really can't trust your natural football instincts, and you got to remain terribly, terribly disciplined. And guys have trouble doing it. And you say bigger, faster, stronger. I, I think the same thing, but it's almost like they're bigger, faster, stronger, but they don't use it. It's almost it's almost for show to, like, have your guns out. But nobody – I mean, I watched the Chargers play the other the other night, and, and it's just everybody's a specialist now as a D lineman. You either rush a passer. You don't have to play the run anymore at all. Um, you come out unless I mean, it's third and long. It's like, what is this? Yeah, Bert, back in the olden days, the I olden mean, days. blocking somebody was sticking your head in their chest. I mean, and everybody, if you'll recall, walked around with collars yeah. because they had per permanently pinched nerves. Mm -hmm. And so every, you never see a collar anymore because it's all the hand stuff and, and so forth, just like you're saying. Different kind of game that way. 
And other people, oh, I'm sorry to interrupt. The other people, people don't realize. You remember we used to have to watch film, and then if you left it on play too long, it would burn <laughs> and then snap. <laughs> the actual film would snap, and then they'd tape it together. So if you got if you got killed on a play, and the coach was real mad, he'd leave it there, it'd burn, and then you'd never have to see it again. That was the only good part we had. <laughs> the, 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 hey, you know, before we get away from the Packers, why are why is the team so beloved? Do you think around the around the globe. I mean, I go someplace with you. I'm, I'm in Key West, Florida with you, and people are flocking up to, to say hello. Why is the team, you're like the, you know, you and the Cowboys. I thought they were selling me T-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> kind of Take a picture with a parrot. I, I, <laughs> well, I, I think it's because it's a story. They just enjoy the story to begin with. The town owns the team, which is, Sort of. Uh, I don't think they get a vote on a whole lot of issues, but they they sort of they have stockholders and there's that ownership element. And, and that's kind of cool. But I, I, I really think it's a story that will never get told again. People love the story. And you look at the economics of today's game and uh, a city of basically 100,000 people can support an NFL, a billion dollar NFL franchise, just not gonna happen. And and because it's it's that kind of singular story, I think people can't get enough of it. And when the Packers are doing well, which they have for a couple of decades, due to Hall of Fame quarterbacking mostly, uh, when the Packers are doing well, I mean, people just love to kind of be part of it and to root for them. And they're kind of everybody's favorite second team. So I have a question on two Hall of Fame quarterbacks. If if there's an avalanche in Green Bay and there's only one seat left on a helicopter to get out and it's Brett Favre and Aaron Rodgers, who gets a seat in Green Bay? Who's deciding? <laughs> <laughs> that's a good, good, good that's, retort. That's true. And here's another one, though. I, so with the whole Aaron Rodgers fiasco going on, do you think that hurts them not having an owner? Like, so Jerry Jones can't just step in and say, give him whatever he wants or do this or do that. You really don't have that one guy, I guess, that can say that, right? Is that is that well, hurt them? Davis, right? Mark, can't Mark Davis. Well, the Green Bay Packers do not have an owner per se that can just go off and and do things without some input from uh, an executive committee. Uh, there's a board of directors, but it's the executive committee that really has significant input. And uh, it, it is a little different, but he's basically our equivalent. And we're speaking of Mark Murphy, yeah, Mark our Murphy. equivalent of an owner. He's the CEO and president of the team. And he, he has a lot of authority and uh, I, I, he can he can pretty much run the show the way he wants to. But he does have to answer to somebody while an owner. Hey. <laughs> Yeah, all bets are off. You can do anything you darn yeah. well. Going back to Bird's question, if you had to decide who would get the seat. Oh, okay. I, I think you're basically asking me a couple different things here. Number one, who's the better quarterback? No, who's Aaron most Rogers beloved? Who's most Farr, beloved? Right? Are, are, is that what we're getting at? Uh, who's yeah, most we, beloved in, in Green Bay? Okay. Beloved, I think I think that title would go to Brett because mm. Brett had a, a, a lot of things. People love uh, guys who, who bounce back from right. issues and things like that. And and, and and Brett was, I mean, I tell you, Brett was human beyond human. Right. He had his human frailties. And and, and, I, and people just uh, love that, that story and, and his ability to bounce back and so forth. I think Aaron Rodgers, uh, like, you know, the fact that he, he possibly wants out or did want out, I, I think you know that you know that certainly turns some people off. But I think when it comes down to just pure quarterbacking play, uh, I think Aaron Rodgers, in my humble opinion, the best ever. Uh, Burt was the eighth pick overall in eighty nine. Wow! What, yeah, what, what, what 80, yeah, 89. 89. You were a twelfth round pick in seventy two. What, three. three, three, three. Share some draft day stories. I'd like to see how you. I'm gonna start with mine because yours are probably the same. I often I watch it now. And it's amazing to me. You, when you I, were the eighth player pick, Bert. Unfortunately, yeah. Are the eighth? Yeah. yeah. Like when when the draft starts, you are player number eight selected. I was in the Tony Mandridge. 
Tony Manos. No, no, draft. no. Your your story is going to be a lot different than mine. <laughs> no, I, 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 Go I, ahead, Bert. Wait, you I have to remember. Hear, I, I got drafted by the Chargers. What it's like to be wanted. <laughs> I want to hear what it's like when a guy with actual ability gets <laughs> no. drafted. Go ahead, Bert. All right, well, you have to remember, I got drafted by the Chargers, so it's going to be like I was a 12th <laughs> rounder, even though I was the 8th pick. I got no phone call from the Chargers. I got nothing. So I got, the morning of the draft, I got Mike Dickett called me, um, woke me up from a drunken stupor from the night before, and said he was going to try to draft or trade for me, which never happened. Ray Perkins, who was at Tampa Bay, called me up and said, you failed the drug test at the Combine, I can't take you. <laughs> didn't hear from anybody. So I didn't hear from the Chargers, and I'm watching the draft on TV like everybody else, and... I just see that they picked me. Never got called by them, never dialed the phone, never did anything. Then I got a bunch of reporters called me, and the Chargers called me like three hours later to send me a plane ticket. Never talked to me, never called oh, me before, cold. never did anything. Just picked me. And what was your... Bert, Bert, at the end of the day... I got a plane ticket. You were the eighth <laughs> freaking player selected in the draft. You know how many players would love to be the eighth player selected? Sure. Bert, you're looking at one of them right here. Okay. In, in, in 1973, okay, the draft wasn't the extravaganza it is now. Okay, there was no TV, nothing like that. It was held like uh, the first week in February, a couple of days, 17 rounds, Bert. Mm. 17 rounds. And so uh, that uh, the draft, the actual draft was 17 rounds long. And uh, it was done over two days. And I wasn't dreaming. I realized I was not the most gifted player in the talent pool that year. I was just hoping to get selected on the first day where they got through five, six rounds, stuff like that. So anyway, draft comes. I'm sitting in my basement apartment in Champaign-Urbana at the University of Illinois, my first basement apartment, $95 a month. I was one of those geniuses that got married during college. And so we're sitting there waiting for that phone to ring, the old hardcore phone like <laughs> yeah. that. It doesn't ring. And it doesn't ring. And so... And you check the cord to see what's in the wall still? I, I have no recourse as far as knowing what's going on but to call the local newspaper, pretend it like I was a fan of <laughs> Illinois football. Anybody from Illinois selected yet? And they said no. And then we had somebody taken in the fourth round, but it wasn't me. And so I am like, I am just, just devastated. The whole day goes and I got there, they're through five, six rounds, nobody calls. So the next day, you get up bright and early, hoping for better. Three, four hours, nobody calls. I get in our 1970 Volkswagen bug with a hole in the floor. I drive to Springfield, Illinois, and back. A couple hours, I come back, still no call. I am suicidal. Finally, the phone rings, and the lady says, hold for Raleigh Dodge of the Green Bay Packers, offensive line coach. So I get on the phone with Raleigh, and he says they selected me in the 12th round. A sense of relief, no elation whatsoever. Just finally somebody picked me, but it's almost embarrassing, the 12th round. What's that? So anyway, he talks to me for a while and makes, you know, hey, we're looking forward to get you at our mini camp and so, so such forth and all that good stuff. And then he tells me, you know, we, we liked what you did at the American Bowl. Well, I didn't have the heart to tell him I didn't play in the American <laughs> Bowl. I, mean, I never heard of the American Bowl. I'm thinking, these guys don't even know who I am, what I did, anything. This is some kind of uh, feel sorry for for your draft choice. And so that's how my draft day went. One of the worst days of my life. And I would love to be the eighth player pick, even if nobody called. Oh, wait, real. Hold on. What was your signing bonus? $3,000. Nice, nice. What was yours? Hey, which, that which, that, that's the best part of the story. I signed for $3,016.16. Not 6 oh, 16000 if I made the team. Uh, okay. A couple weeks later, <laughs> The assistant coaches used to go out and sign guys, and they'd start at the bottom of the draft. 
and worked their way up. Well, they were at my door like the next day. <laughs> and, and, and the assistant coach, a guy by the name of Red Cockrum, he was their backfield coach. He signs me to three and 16 if I made the team. So a week later, he calls me up and says, Larry, I screwed up. I gave you too much money and I need some of it. <laughs> <laughs> I swear. Yeah. Well, it all worked out in the end because you're, you're in the team hall of fame. So, hey, uh, could, speak to young linemen out there right now who, uh, we, you know, we, we have a lot of, we're, we're kind of a hotbed for high school football out here, Larry. we got a lot of kids who go D1. Uh, yeah. speak, to, speak to those kids right now. We have a segment called uh, uh, Shaq's Pig Pen where uh, we just feature interior linemen. And I want you to talk to those guys. What, what, what should young linemen be working on right now? Well, I hate like everybody's different and so forth. I, I would say, and this applies to every group, every position group, is uh, never shortchange yourself when it comes to effort. It's the one thing you're in total control of. Uh, nobody determines that but you. And regardless of position, never shortchange the effort part of it. Go out there every day and practice with a purpose. Do what your coaches tell you. Do it to the best of your ability. And when it comes time for Friday night and all that stuff and PPR and all that stuff, enjoy it. It's the greatest team sport ever invented. And trust me, it's a privilege to play it. And you're getting to play it. And I don't care what level, at the high school level, and if you're lucky enough to go on and so forth, Greatest team sport ever invented. It's a privilege to play it, so enjoy it. Hey, so the most fascinating thing for me is, so you played 10 years back when it was really brutal and medical was really bad. Barbaric. <laughs> Barbaric. <laughs> How do you go 10 years and, and start 12. like uh, 12 yeah. or, and start 170 games in a row and then actually then make start making the Pro Bowls? I can't, I mean, after seven years, I was done physically just because it was so brutal. I mean, at that point, most guys came and walked back then after 10 years, and you're making the Pro Bowl after that. How's that happen? Yeah, how did that happen? Uh, well, I think, I, I mean, I was never, I, I would never say I was a great player. I was a try-hard guy, and you know what I mean, Bert, in every sense of the word. I was a try-hard guy, and I played uh, pretty good for a long time, and that's how I got in the uh, into the uh, Pro Bowl, which was, uh, you know, just a, a, a great, great honor. And, uh, and it kind of capped things off for me. Because uh, when you come up as a 12th rounder and a try-hard guy, I mean, getting with the NFL's real players, that, that was big-time stuff. Uh, but I, I think the biggest thing for me was uh, just I had coaches that had patience and uh, let me – grow into the player that I wanted to be, but I wasn't when I started. I, you know, I was undersized and stuff like that. And so, you know, Bert, uh, I don't know what you guys did, but ate like no tomorrow, lifted weights all the time and, and did all those things because uh, it was really, really important to me. And it was as simple as that. And then uh, uh, the good Lord watches out for you. And while you have injuries, none were uh, so debilitating, I couldn't keep going. Can you tell your Bill Walsh story when you were at the Pro Bowl and you guys were walking? Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, okay. So, I mean, they, I mean, going to the Pro Bowl hey, after 10 years, uh, man, that, that was really cool. And, and, and you're seeing all these, you know, like really, I mean, the real big-time players. I mean, it was just great. And so uh, I'm walking around the pool. We just got there walking around the pool, and then uh, there's like a pier off the hotel. And I think, well, this is – there's the ocean. I'm going to go look at the ocean. So I'm walking along the pier, and 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 all of a sudden, I'm walking next to Bill Walsh of the San Francisco 49ers. Now, now he's famous, you know, <laughs> and he know me from Adam, but I had that that football player look to me, you know, and and so he started talking to me. And I, I mean, it's Bill Walsh. I mean, this is so cool. I'm walking right next to him. And we're walking down the pier. And, and, and like, as he's talking, and, 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 and Bill Walsh can wax eloquently on virtually any subject. And so I don't know if he's talking to me about the ocean or, or marine biology or just football. But we're walking along, and I'm seeing a, a low lamp with an overhang that goes over the, the pier. 
and 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 like it, it, it's coming up and and slow enough, it's it, it would kind of decapitate <laughs> you if, if you run into it hard enough. And so Bill is talking. I can't interrupt. <laughs> He, he's talking, and, and I'm looking ahead, and there's this low overhanging rod. And, and, and you know, and he keeps talking, and, and, and I can't interrupt. It's Bill Walsh, he's, he's going to be in all of fame. I'm, I'm just, uh, you know, smucky Larry. I can't interrupt him. So we keep walking, and pretty soon, and Bill's talking and talking, and bang! He looks at the thing, and he looks at me like, you stupid <laughs> mor- oh. <laughs> I, wait, I thought it was, I th- at least he didn't say I love what you did to the Americans, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Bobby, uh, Rock, I know you got to go. Uh, just a couple more. Couple more uh, your, your advice for young broadcasters? <laughs> Don't get into it. <laughs> <laughs> Stay no. out. <laughs> no, I mean, you got to have, a, a, like in my case, like, now, Paul, you're, you're a very talented guy. And, and and in my case, I, I, I was just, I'll do this and and until I can find like a real job and stuff like that. And I was so like hideous, awful that I stuck with it so I wouldn't quit a failure. And then all of a sudden, you got a career. But you know, to young people, I'd say get your at bats. I mean, uh, at first, uh, be willing to get paid and experience, and, and, and get your at bats because you. You never will get that, you know, comfort level on camera unless you get on camera. So uh, I would say that. But I'd also say this, and, and you guys disagree if you want to, but set an age where it's happening or it's not. And if it's not happening for you, then get out and, and, and get on with your life. And and so you you don't you don't want to you, you don't want to be doing what I'm doing when you're 69 years old. <laughs> hey, so I I'm always fascinated. Maybe you have some insight in this. What do you think it is that goes off the rails? Same team, same everything. You know, my year was Tony Manners, supposedly the greatest and great guy. Friends, we had him on the show. Greatest offensive line prospect ever picked. You're a 12th round pick. Get three thousand dollars. You're in the Ring of Fame, the Hall of Fame. He's not. What do you think the difference is and what goes wrong? You think it's mentally? You think it's the situation? What, what is it that goes wrong with something like that for somebody? Uh, like, I, I know Tony, and, and I thought expectations for him were off the charts. I, I think uh, there was some overblown opinions of his athletic ability. I don't think Tony was, and, and Bert, you'll know what I mean, he wasn't blessed with great feet. Mm-hmm. And it's hard to play outside without great feet. And I, I'm folks, I'm meaning, you know, the pitter patter feet that the, the great tackles have. He didn't have that, and you can kind of see it in the first day. And so he had to play outside, trying to deal with that. So uh, I, I think that uh, hurt him. Uh, not a bad guy, and I don't think he. It was a lack of effort, but uh, he wasn't. I don't think he was the athlete. He was given credit for being when he was uh, whatever choice. Was he the first guy picked? He was the second. second. Sanders was yeah, first. Yeah, I right? mean, something like or that. And, uh, you know, and then people love to talk about the Hall of Famers who were drafted after him. But I, I don't think that was Tony's doing. But in my case, I mean, it really was. I mean, uh, like I grew up, I mean, I went, when I got in high school and found out you know, I, some of this stuff comes easy to me, and I'm, and I, you know, I, you know, I'm not the the smallest kid in class. I thought, you know, I would love to be a pro football player, and and it was really a goal. A uh, uh, that was my mission, and, uh, and 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 it was and it was really in a in a not so life and death kind of way, a life and death thing with me. It was important, and I think that's why things kind of worked out over time. All right, let's wrap this out on a fun note. Uh, let's talk about the Mike Tyson fight. We were we, we were at the uh, MGM with you. Who was our foursome? It was Wag- Steve Wagner, Greg Cook, and you and me, right? You? Yeah. yeah. So we go in to see the Mike. yourself. Uh, you know, we th- we thought we were such big spenders because we dropped like I don't know. F- so we paid what was it fifteen hundred dollars and thinking we were going to be sitting ringside. If we get there, we're in the upper ring of the fire. I mean, we, could, we, could, we could not see, we couldn't even see the monitors well enough to know what was going on. But we were at the fight, and we don't know really what happened. The fight gets stopped. We're wondering what's going on. And we're leaving the MGM, and I'll let Larry pick it up from there. Because oh, we, we could have been killed. <laughs> but what a story that would have been. <laughs> Who would have told it? But this was the, 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 the Mike Tyson 
Evander Holyfield ear fight. Yeah. And 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 so the place is nuts. The uh, atmosphere is electric. And every one of us said, hey, whatever it costs to see, sit ringside, next fight, we're sitting ringside. Uh, you know, whether whether never was a next fight. But so afterwards, people, the gambling money is kind of ticked off because they got shortchanged with this disqualification over the year thing or whatever it was. So we're coming out, and so we're walking down hallways, very crowded, and so we stop. Uh, uh, well, you know, we're just we're, we're still walking, figuring out what to do because the fight got stopped real early, and all of a sudden there's some bang, bang, bangs, and, and somebody says shots fired like this, and it, there's like a stampede, <laughs> and so we run and we get into a bar that we can kind of there's stuff to kind of duck behind and everybody's ducking behind and so we're hiding behind the counter peeking out <laughs> to see what's going on with the, the shots being fired and so forth and uh it was it was fairly scary but exciting all at the same time <laughs> and one of our great cook who was a former nfl player uh now but uh, was one of my teammates he was with us, and he's the only guy in the bar that didn't get on the floor. He's a, he's sitting there on his stool. <laughs> and what do you say, Paul? Oh, because like seven guys, seven gangster-looking guys, all dressed in white, <clears throat> but they were all under five foot five. They were the shortest bunch of gangsters, and they're and they're you see them run, and then they're. Bunch of uh, Barney Fife's chase after him. Greg Cook didn't want to get on the ground because he had an expensive, I don't know what what he drank back then, scotch. but it was, yeah, it was you know, like a $200 glass of scotch or something. And, and so the sheriff comes running, oh, did you see anything, sir? And Greg Cook, just like Clint Eastwood, takes a sip and goes, Shoot low, Sheriff. They're riding Shetlands. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was the, That's the, not the fight where uh, uh, Biggie and, and Suge Knight got shot, is it? No. Was that the same fight? I that, think it was, yeah. That oh, might have been well, the people I shot him. You were witnessing. They shut down the casino, which is, in my recollection, Never might happens. be the only time that's ever happened. Never happened. Yeah. Hey, uh, uh, you know, uh, Rock, just one more minute. NFL and politics. Yeah. NFL and politics. Is it getting too political? Oh, I think uh, they ought to leave the game alone. Let the game be the game. Personal opinion. Oh, well, you said that was the last question. Huh? Well, all right. Well, you know what? I'm not. Fair. Yeah, I kind of. You always do this to me. Hey, uh, do you have uh, CT, CTE concerns? Playing as long as uh, you see what's going on in the NFL. <laughs> I mean, you're very lucid. Compared to us, though, that's not saying much. <laughs> was it kind of disappointing? You were ho 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 hoping for a, for a concussion type segment. <laughs> well, no, I mean, do, uh, is that something you? Uh, I mean, do, does everybody go get tested? Have you been tested? I have a drool oh. cup. <laughs> Here, I use a drool cup. He does the same thing to me. Don't worry about it. No, like uh, I, you know what? I'm kind of a hypochondriac, and so when they ask you to get tested or you can do it, I mean, they got a bunch of programs for former players, uh, and they're, they're really making a, a concerted effort to take care of people, but I'm kind of a hypochondriac, so when you can go get tested, if, if I'm losing it, I don't want to know. Because if I, they told me, you know, you got problems, I'd have bigger problems by the time I got home. So I just kind of let it go. <laughs> well, you, I think you're doing great, Larry. And th this was a very entertaining conversation. <laughs> and I know how busy you are. And I know how you uh, don't like to do stuff like this to begin with. So it, it's, uh, it's, it's very I'm much not, appreciated. I'm not, this, is, this is Tuesday. I'm looking at film. I'm boring. So is anyway, it snowing, there? Is it snowing there yet or no? Do you get any snow yet or no? Oh, just a little... A little sprinkling this morning. God, just I can't burnt. No, no, it's, it's a nice day still. <laughs> uh, he almost no, got me no, killed in Key West. No, we could have it by next week, but it's a nice day. We, uh, we, we ride little scooters in Key West, and we were going to another. What was the fight we oh. went to? What was the most recent? That was the uh, Conor McGregor. Uh, M MMA fight, yeah. or whatever. And so we're driving, and we leave, and just like in the movie Caddyshack, I, go, I don't think the heavy stuff's coming down yet. And it's like a 15-minute scooter drive through the backwoods of Key West. It started to pour. I mean, that it was as miserable. Okay, Pablo, Pablo. Okay, that was okay. Your second dumbest idea in Kid West. <laughs> your first dumbest was renting those damn skidoos. That was that was one hour of hell. One hour of hell. That was that was your dumbest yeah, the, idea. On the open washing, man. It, it was. Uh, You're grown professional men riding scooters in Key West. <laughs> <Yeah>. Well. <laughs> 
I'll tell you what, you, you haven't you haven't gone on vacation until you vac vacation with Larry McCarran. Mr. McCarran, this uh, conversation's officially over. Please hit the terminate button, and I'll I'll talk to you when I talk to you. I'll, I won't bother you until after the football season. Pablo, great to see you. Thanks Thank for having me. And Bert, nice meeting you. You too, Larry. Thank Your you so much. Your love and respect, Larry McCarran. player in the draft. The <laughs> eighth player. And I'm still doing this with him. See? <clears throat> Bye, Larry.